Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Cosmos Show, place to be if you're curious about the cosmos. I'm your host, Dr. Sam, founder and executive director of Wyoming Stargazing. Uh, remember that you can chat your questions in Twitch uh, and in uh, YouTube. Uh, you can also call in and ask your questions live by calling 929-205-6099. Uh, that number should be at the bottom of your screen along with the meeting ID that you'll need to connect with us. So, uh, so yeah, give us a call, chat with us. We would love to hear from you. Uh, tonight's show is about astronomy outreach. Uh, so we're going to talk about why it's worth spending all of your time looking up as well as about the uh, recent um, space tourism flights that have just happened this month. Um, so pretty exciting stuff. Our special guest later tonight is Valerie um, Steinick. Uh, she is a um, space tourism writer and author of the book Dark Skies, A Practical Guide to Astrotourism. Um, but before Valerie joins us later on, let's welcome our co-stars. Uh, first, we've got a medical doctor and founder of Orbital Biodesign. It's Dr. Danny Carroll. Everybody, nice to see you. Great to have you here, Danny. Uh, next, um, PH candidate in astrophysics from the University of Chicago and host of her own YouTube show, Nora's Guide to the Galaxy. It's Nora Bailey. Hi, everyone. So happy to be here again. Thanks for joining us, Nora. Uh, next, uh, Deputy Director of Education and Public Outreach at the Vera Rubin Observatory, it's Dr. Lauren Corleys. Hi, happy to be back. Thanks for being here. And last but certainly not least, uh, postdoctoral scholar from the Sivens Observatory, it's Nick Kalitsky. Hi, everybody. Hey, Nick. Um, all right, so today we're going to have Danny share a little bit about um, her current work and her field of study um, and uh, what she's up to. So Danny, we're all yours. All right, awesome. So um, if we can advance to the next slide, please. Thank you very much. So today, as, as Sam mentioned, I'm Dr. Danny Carroll. Um, I have what I feel is a huge honor and privilege to get to work on stuff like this. Um, you know, this is one project that I'll be telling you guys about today, but there are a whole bunch more things like this uh, that I get to be a part of, which is, uh, I wake up every morning just in awe, so it's pretty cool. Um, but today I wanted to tell you guys a little bit more about the glove design project that I had spoken about briefly last time. Um, everybody gets really excited about spacewalks, uh, mostly because they're just so cool. <laughs> um, you know, I, they're cool enough for lots of movies to be made out of them uh, or to be made about them. So I think we're probably all on the same page about that. But I think oftentimes folks don't recognize all that really goes into making them happen. Um, in reality, the spacesuit is the world's smallest spacecraft. And so, you know, it, it needs to be designed with all of that in mind. And not surprisingly, the spacesuit glove is oftentimes one of the most technically challenging uh, engineering design problems that we need to try to tackle, um, mostly because you know, it needs to be able to facilitate all the really fancy things that astronauts have to do when they're on spacewalks. Uh, and you can see in some of the pictures that I've got on this slide, you know, twisting things, using the tether um, in the bottom left-hand picture, um, you know, being able to, to grab onto stuff. So there's a certain amount of um, manual dexterity that's necessary and that must be facilitated by the glove. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that the glove, just like the rest of the suit, needs to be pressurized. So every time you make a movement, you have to actually push against a force to be able to open your hand and close your hand and twist your hand and do all those different movements. So next slide, please. Um, so we'll get into a little bit about um, why, you know, what the problem is. Um, so we, we refer to um, spacewalks mostly in the industry as extravehicular activity or EVA. So you'll hear me just kind of using the term EVA on and off throughout this presentation. Um, but they're physically demanding and very high risk for lots of reasons. Um, my team chose to focus on the glove um, specifically for a number of reasons, but the, the biggest of which is that we are tired of seeing astronauts lose their fingernails after spacewalks. Um, believe it or not, you know, for some of the reasons that I described and more, um, astronauts tend to develop these bruises underneath their nails 
after, you know, six, seven, sometimes eight or eight and a half hours on a spacewalk from these repetitive movements and kind of constantly gripping on things. Um, it's been very challenging, believe it or not, to figure out exactly why this is happening. You can imagine there are so many forces going on. There are forces that are pressing down on the nails, forces pressing in, forces pressing up, you know, when somebody's gripping against something. And so it's it's unclear, it's been unclear up to, you know, up until more recently, exactly what's been causing that. Um, but as you can see, I've kind of mapped out on this slide, you know, there, there are a whole bunch of different risk factors um, or risks that are involved in spacewalks or in EVAs. And we've chosen to focus on this part specifically. So next slide, please. And so here's a little bit more about some of the, uh, the nuts and bolts of, uh, you know, of the pressures on the finger that I tried to describe just a moment ago. Um, that red arrow that you see is primarily where a lot of the pain is experienced. Um, in, in undertaking this particular project, my team has interviewed um, three astronauts, two current and one retired, <clears throat> pardon me, and have basically come around to the conclusion that the majority of the force that we have to deal with or that we're contending with is at that, that little point that's right where the nail meets the, the skin right there where that little red arrow is pointing, which is called the hyponychium. And then you end up with something called subungual bruising when there's enough pressure there. And so that just, that's a fancy way of saying there's bruising underneath the nail. Just like if you go for a long run with shoes that are too tight and you develop bruises underneath your toenails, it's a similar concept, um, but it's been a little bit more complex to actually fix that problem. So, um, so we believe that that's most likely the, cause of all of this, but because there are so many other competing factors involved, we've had to kind of pick and choose what we go after. Um, let's see here. So, you know, on, on the right side of the screen there, yeah, we can, we can go to the next slide. It's okay. <laughs> I kind of described in that one, some of the uh, nuances of the project, but I think we can just um, move forward. So um, some of the advantages or some of our targets that we're hoping to really um, to get to in this design project is to make sure that the gloves, the, the modifications that we make that we hope will be incorporated into the current glove design. And we're actually interfacing with some folks down at um, Johnson Space Center to be able to make this happen. Um, but we're hoping to not only make the gloves safer and more comfortable, um, but also to ultimately increase productivity. Because you can imagine, you know, it's one thing if you have an astronaut on a spacewalk or on an EVA, um, and it's once on a six month mission, or maybe three times on a six month mission, you know, that's on the International Space Station, and then they come right back down to Earth, and the nails fall off, you know, within several days or so following, you know, this event. Um, but, you know, it, I guess on the ISS right now, it's less of, a, of an issue, but long term, when we're talking about, you know, doing stuff on the surface of the moon or the surface of Mars, if we have people's fingernails falling off, you know, falling off right and left, it's a huge problem, not just for, um, for functionality, but for infection reasons and stuff like that. So uh, lots, of, lots of reasons to really make sure that we can solve this problem well. Um, and what's pretty cool is that we've actually got a couple of upcoming presentations at two conferences. One is the International Astronautical Congress, um, which is gonna be in Dubai this coming October. And then the AIAA Ascend Conference, which is an engineering conference, but this is in the bioastronautics realm um, in Las Vegas in November. So we're pretty excited about that research. But um, with that, uh, I'm happy to take any questions that you guys might have. So you're saying that nail salons are gonna be all over the moon and Mars, just to like <laughs> artificial nails back on those exposed fingertips. Oh. Oh man, well, I mean, if we if we can do our job well, then hopefully we won't have any need for those whatsoever. <laughs> but in I theory, know. I guess maybe. Just thinking of like the movie Ad Astra, I think they showed an Applebee's on like that moon base. <laughs> Why not a nail salon? Seems like there's a need oh, for man. it. Sorry. <laughs> so that's somebody else with a more, more productive and factual question for Danny. <laughs> I had a question. I was wondering what's like the biggest change that you're proposing to make things safer and more comfortable? Yeah, yeah. So we've um, we've come up with, and the reason that I didn't put pictures on here is that it's, you know, we're still in the process of, of making some of the finer points. And um, because we're interfacing with folks down at JSC, we wanna make sure we don't necessarily divulge too much. Um, but the um, the kind of net effect or the bigger picture is that what we're, we're planning on doing is having some sort of augmentation to the muscular piece um, to be able to 
kind of augment because one of the other things that I really haven't, I didn't highlight so much in this presentation, but I, it was mentioned on a couple of the slides is that oftentimes astronauts um, forearm muscles, like the hand and forearm muscles get very tired very early. So you can imagine if an EVA is seven or eight hours long, normally it's on the order of about seven, give or take a little bit. Um, that's a long time for you to be gripping onto something. And oftentimes, you know, they'll, they're tethered in a, and usually in two places uh, more often than not, but you're still gripping something and then you're doing something with your other hand. So that's a long time to be fighting pressure, you know, a pressured glove to grip something. Whereas if we, if we have the mech, you know, a mechanism that we can develop um, or that we have developed to be able to, you know, augment that force and then help us to kind of keep that grip with a little bit less, um, muscular challenge, you know, or muscular effort required, then that's great. And then the other thing is that we're developing kind of an apparatus for the tip of the fingers um, to be able to mitigate some of the delamination, nail delamination or nail falling off issues. It's called onycholysis. That's the technical term. But, yeah. Cool. Yeah, because I hadn't thought about that. Cause I guess like the natural position of your hands is sort of slightly curved. It's not just out or gripping. Mm -hmm. So having something to help you with that. Yeah, neat. Yeah. And most yeah. gloves, you know, if you, if you see, if you ever put on a pair of gloves and you look and see how far your fingers go or how close your fingers go to the tip of the glove, it changes based upon your, you know, mm -hmm. the, the motion or the position of your hand. Um, yeah. And so that's a consideration in all of this. If we're trying to build something, you know, to build a framework, you know, a matrix to be able to protect the fingertip, we need to account for that. Um, so it's been a really interesting design project, you know, yeah. some really cool challenges to tackle. I was curious, are, are you able to test this on Earth? I was, you know, I know they put the astronauts in like pools and stuff to play around with things. Do they lose their nails in the pools? Is this something you can try out? They do, they do. So actually on that slide that you guys see right there, NBL is the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. Um, and that's that's the big giant pool that they do all their spacewalk training in. And the, the general rule of thumb, no pun intended, I guess, is that um, it's, about one hour of training, or so 10 hours of training in the pool for every one hour actually on a spacewalk. Um, and so, you know, that's, you can imagine that the majority of the injuries that are sustained really are sustained in the pool, but it's using the same de you know, devices, the same apparatus that would be used in flight. Um, so absolutely. And that's, that's where a lot of the, you know, the testing is done. That's why this, the lab is actually on site at Johnson Space Center. Um, you know, like the, the primary spacesuit glove design lab. Um, and then they have kind of satellites for other folks like me and my team that's been collaborating on this kind of stuff. So did you ever get a fully suit up? Um, I have not. No, I mean, as a part of this project. So once we have a fully functional prototype, which we anticipate we were, so there, I think have been some challenges with respect to the, the COVID scheduling and kind of, you know, pandemic planning issues across the board. Um, and NASA certainly is, you know, uh, has been suffering from that <laughs> as well, you know, delays associated with that, but we are hoping to be able to actually test this in the NBL at some point. So. Very cool. That's on the agenda. Well, I hope you get to keep your nails. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> now, how disappointing would it be to like lose your nails just in training in a pool on earth? Like it's one thing to sacrifice your nails on, a, on an EVA up in space, but <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I don't think I'd have quite the tolerance for it here on earth. <laughs> I kind of had a, a logistics oh. question, um, mm -hmm. if you can answer this. I, I guess I'm just curious. Um, so you mentioned that you're working on this prototype that works with the glove. Like how, how does NASA manage the entire suit? Is it like NASA manages the suit and they subcontract out or they contract out like pieces of the suit or is it like they contract out the suit and then that contractor subcontracts out? Like, I'm just a little curious, like what the flow I guess is here. Yeah, so I know that there are different pieces and parts that are, are you know, developed, like built, so developed and built and refined by different companies. Um, but ultimately, you know, NASA is, of course, the hub. Um, so the, I think the extent to which those different pieces are contracted out, I, I don't know that I can really answer that. It just kind of depends on the part, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the part of the mini spacecraft, if you will. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, as you guessed, kind of everything is really integrated, you know, at like, you know, at NASA, that's- Okay, that's, so they're not like buying know. a spacesuit from someone. Oh, no, They're no, no, making no. the spacesuit and buying the components right. is more, yeah. okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I and used to work in a government office. Testing. I'm like always curious about, about mm -hmm. the machinery that makes this happen. Cause I know it is quite complex. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and there are, there are a lot of different pieces and parts that go into it. 
you know so that's so cool I think it's yeah it's important to have them be the kind of centralized hub for this stuff but, yeah. thanks for the good questions Oh, cool. Um, I pick that one, Danny. So what do you think is the mechanism that hits the particular site on the nail? Um, so what I think personally, I think it's probably a combination of things, you know, and there's actually a, another competing theory that, that perhaps it's a function of the, the humid environment within the glove, that that's kind of a contributing factor because presumably people are sweating as they're exerting force, you know, you know, providing effort to be able to achieve tasks um, during uh, an EVA. Um, so there is the humidity piece, but then there's also what I, I believe that it's probably in this direction, but there, there actually, there is some evidence now that there is force in this direction. So part of it depends on what tasks are actually being performed, um, you know, on a given, uh, like a given EVA, it could be that, you know, on a particular, like, you know, for one particular crew member, they are doing this motion over and over and over again. And so when they're in the neutral buoyancy lab, they do this motion over and over and over again, you know, for 10 hours ultimately, <laughs> you know, to train for that one hour. Um, so that's a lot of exposure to that particular repetitive motion. Um, so it really, it could be either this in this direction, can you guys see my hands or, or in this direction? I think it's a, realistically, I think it's a combination of the two because uh, we see evidence of both in the, you know, in the images of, uh, of folks' nails, so. Is it like physically touching the inside of the glove or is it just from like the pressure and the, the motion? Um, sometimes yes and sometimes no. You know, and I think part of the challenge is that often, I, I know that's a really unsatisfying answer, but, but the, the part of the problem is that oftentimes, you know, folks are understandably so focused on what they're do, like what the task is, uh, that they're not thinking about, you know, gosh, that's a little bit uncomfortable or ooh, there's a little pinch there, you know? Um, and so it's, it's kind of after the fact when they, yeah, I think, there, I guess there was a little bit of pressure here, so. Interesting. Um, and like how, sorry, I have, like, I'm so curious about this, yeah. but like how much of a, a size range do they have with these gloves? Cause like, I feel like hand size like really varies a lot. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no, really no. A lot. And so I'm just curious, I guess, if there's like two sizes or three sizes. Or... Oh no, so I, I think ultimately they're sized to the individual, like, it, so there are modifications. What I anticipate is that they're going to become like increasingly, um, increasingly personalized over time. As it stands right now, I think there are three sizes, four sizes. I honestly don't know the answer to that question um, okay. definitively with the like the latest iteration of the glove. Um, you know, like how many sizes there are total. We're focusing on one size and developing our modifications, and we want to make sure that that works first, uh, which we think it does. But um, but yeah, so I, I think long range, what I suspect, and especially for like planetary, you know, planetary surface operations ultimately, because that's extravehicular activity too, right? You know, it's just on the surface of another planet. Um, I think it's going to be important to, to make sure that folks' gloves are really spot on, you know, yeah. really designed, like, you know, fitted perfectly to prevent injuries and stuff. Do you so. see a gender difference in the fingernail? issues between the female and male astronauts? Um, not that I've come across. I mean, part of the, part of the problem is that the end number is so small, um, <laughs> but you know, like just across the board in terms of folks that, that do go on EVA, um, you know, or, or folks that are training in the NDL, but I've heard of it happening to men. I've heard, you know, of it happening to women. Um, so yeah, I think it's going to boil down to fit and, you know, the, the task and like the specific forces that are involved in, in specific tasks. So we need to design for those tasks, you know. Cool. Well, well that was great, Danny. Um, thanks so much for sharing that with us. Um, my guess is everyone listening is just as surprised as we were to learn about the fingernail issues with astronauts. So yeah, thanks so much for sharing. Sure thing, no problem. Um, so as I, I mentioned earlier, um, tonight's theme is astronomy outreach. And, you know, for those of us who do astronomy outreach, we try to engage our, um, our guests as much as possible. And we try to do that by making things fun for people. And so our, uh, our Nobel uh, notes today is from uh, Nobel laureate uh, Roger Penrose, um, who um, recently won the Nobel Prize uh, for his work 
in understanding how the formation of black holes is a prediction of general relativity. And he shared that uh, Nobel Prize with um, two other people just um, last year, uh, Andrea uh, Getz and um, Reinhard, I can't remember his last name right now, that's embarrassing. There were three people. Um, how, does somebody know his last name, Reinhard? Anyways. There, there were three folks who shared the Nobel Prize in uh, physics this uh, this past year. But anyways, um, what um, Roger Penrose has for us this evening is that science and fun cannot be separated. Um, and I think that is um, absolutely right on. Um, you know, my guess is even these astronauts who are losing their fingernails are having a whole lot of fun <laughs> doing. Oh, uh, Genzel, thank you. <laughs> Reinhard Genzel, thanks Valerie. Our, uh, our special guest is bailing me out already. Um, so um, yeah, um, if anybody, uh, any of the uh, the co-stars um, have any response to the Nobel note, we can uh, we can take those. Uh, and if not, we can go right into virtual stargazing. Yeah, I I think I love this quote, and I think especially specific to astronomy we have such a built-in advantage in outreach because the pictures are so pretty and people love to look at them and I love to look at them and I think it's like a gateway drug, right? It like gets people excited about astronomy and then from there they can maybe, they might branch out into other fields that are related to astronomy. I know my personal work that my research that I do, I don't observe, I don't look at like pretty pictures, I look at computer simulations all day, but that still was one of the things that got me interested in it and I think I think that's a really cool thing about astronomy is that we have this built-in advantage that we can use to get the general public really excited about science in general, not just astronomy. So true. Um, yeah, astronomy is definitely a gateway science, without a doubt. Yeah, and for me, the part that's so fun about being a scientist is also how creative you get to be. Like you're solving all these problems that no one's ever thought about before. And so you get to play around with different ideas. What if I try this or try and solve this problem this way? And so that's always the, my big thing that I'm trying to communicate is that it's not like in school when you're doing a math problem and there's steps you need to follow. It's a lot more creative than that. And so it's just as creative as being an artist. It's just being expressed in a slightly different way, I think. And that's fun. Totally agree. Yeah, well said. Nick, anything? I was kind of thinking on the experimental side. I'm like, oh no, I've had some days that weren't always very fun, but long term, overall, yes. Yeah, I mean, Roger Penrose didn't say science is all fun. He just said it's <laughs> not separable. <laughs> yeah, what's the ratio of science to fun? <laughs> yeah, that, that definitely depends on the day, without a doubt. All right, well, we should, we should probably get into virtual stargazing. Um, we've got a segment for you tonight that we recorded last week with our virtual stargazer down in South Africa, Ben Coley. Uh, he showed us some super cool stuff. We're gonna share that with you in just a moment and then we'll come back with our local virtual stargazer, uh, Dr. Mike Adler. And he's gonna show us some um, incredibly cool uh, images that he processed of Jupiter. Uh, so enjoy virtual stargazing and we'll see you back here in just a moment. Hey everybody, Samuel Singer here, the founder and executive director of Wyoming Stargazing. I'm here with Ben Coley, the founder of Celestial Events South Africa. Uh, it's a beautiful afternoon in Jackson, Wyoming, uh, about 1.15 p.m. right now, but a little bit later in South Africa. Um, so Ben's got some cool stuff to share with us. And so uh, with that, Ben, uh, welcome. Thanks so much for being here and um, we're all yours. Yeah, oh, thanks very much, Samo. So uh, delighted to be to be back again. As you can see, it's a nice fresh evening here, probably around about 10, 11 degrees Celsius. Uh, and as you said, yeah, I've got a couple of interesting southern sky objects to show you guys. So I've got the camera, uh, which is just a, a Nikon D7000 DSLR attached to the 10-inch Mead telescope. 
Um, and I'm going to start you off with Centaurus A, which is the fifth brightest galaxy in the night sky. It's a starburst galaxy in the constellation of Centaurus, as the name suggests. Um, and yeah, so I'm just going to, I'm taking a 60 second exposure as we speak, and I'll share the screen with you. And hopefully we'll see what we've got. So yeah, so this is Centaurus A, so this is a 60 second image. Uh, you can clearly see this sort of... Um, globule of, uh, of light. Let me just see if I can increase the color a little bit so we can, uh, sorry, increase the brightness a little bit. Just do a quick curve stretch. Oh yeah, that's fantastic. Very cool. Okay, so I don't want to sort of process it too hard and uh, say keep you guys here for too long, but hopefully it gives you a good idea of, uh, of what is actually there, there. Now you can clearly see what makes it quite an unusual galaxy, which is this dark band uh, running across it. And as I said, fifth bright brightest galaxy in the sky, and it is a, a starburst galaxy. What we actually think has happened is right here in the center, um, you can see it was a, an ancient elliptical galaxy, which is in the process of swallowing, so, uh, yes, uh, swallowing a spiral galaxy. And because of that interaction and all the gravitational forces and uh, that's going on in there, we've had this sort of uh, great burst of star formation, particularly in, in this disk here. Very cool. um, in term, yeah, in terms of um, sort of size, we're looking at, it's not too dissimilar to, to our Milky Way, just, just over 100,000 uh, light years across. Um, and it's about somewhere between sort of 14 to 16 million light years away. So yeah, very cool object out here. You can even see it uh, on under dark skies uh, with a pair of binoculars if you know where to look. It's very close to the Omega Centauri globular cluster that you showed last week. Very cool. Um, do you know the distance of that one, Ben? Uh, I do. Uh, just give me a moment to remember. Uh, yeah, sort of about around about 15, 16 million light years away. Oh, yeah, so just a hop, skip, and a jump. It's a close one. Yeah, not not far to go at all. We'll we'll pop pop up there very shortly. But it's also receding at around four hundred and eighty kilometers a second. So I suggest that if we're going to go, the sooner we go, the better. <laughs> uh, but that's <laughs> uh, but that's the standard sort of Hubble flow in terms of the expansion of the of the galaxy. That's what we would expect. Um, but yeah, but it's it's a stunning object. This one. Yeah. So what are we talking? Like a trillion stars in that one, since it's a a large elliptical. Um. That one, I haven't been able to find out the, the exact number, but as you said, being an elliptical that's probably gone through a few cannibalisms of other galaxies in its time, um, yeah, I would think it's, it's a pretty big number for, for one with that diameter, certainly. And you, you mentioned the term starburst galaxy. You're referring to rapid star formation, right? Yeah, so, so what happens is with all that energy being released by these two galaxies colliding and the, the larger elliptical sort of swallowing up the spiral is you get um, an awful lot of agitation of the dust and the, and the gases in the spiral galaxy. And in this band here where sort of all, all the magic is happening, that promotes uh, a whole new um, uh, sort of burst of star formation, hence, hence the name Starburst Galaxy. And they've taken uh, ultraviolet views of Centaurus A and found over a hundred areas of star formation just within this band as well. Uh, not true. to mention, of course, yeah, there's, it's, it's, there's a lot going on up there. Uh, and that's, of course, not even to mention the, uh, the X-rays, the gamma rays and the radio bursts that are coming out of what we assume is a supermassive black hole at the center, uh, somewhere around about 50 to 55 million suns or solar masses. Uh, and because this uh, black hole is, uh, sort of, yeah, feeding, if you like, on all of this uh, activity here. A lot of it is being injected uh, along the poles. Uh, and if you see a sort of a full-scale Hubble image where they've got various different wavelengths of light, you can see these great jets spanning light years off into space from the poles. Very cool. Um, we'll have to share an image of that at some point. Cool. Yeah, so, so that's yeah. one of the best galaxies that we've got down here. That's awesome. Um, what else do you have for us tonight? Well, I thought we'd try, since we did um, one of the, the Omega Centauri last week with the or last episode, the, the largest and uh, brightest globular cluster in the sky. I thought I'd show you another one. So we're blessed down here in the Southern Hemisphere. We've got uh, many of the brightest globulars in the sky, uh, certainly three of the top four, which aren't visible from northern latitudes at all. Uh, so I'm going to show you the, the Pavo 
glob globular cluster next in Pabo the Peacock, which is also a southerly constellation. So if you give me a few minutes, I'm just going to realign the telescope and we'll get a, a picture on the go. That sounds great. Um, while you're uh, realigning, if you want to share a little bit about what type of telescope you're using, I think that might be interesting to folks. Yeah, sure. Um, so I've got a bit of a bit of a mishmash here. I started out with the uh, a Mead LX200 on its original alt azimuth mount, but obviously as my interest in uh, photography has gone up, then I have also. Sorry if I seem distracted. I'm just trying to remember all the uh, the, the numbers for the objects. Oh, no worries. Coldwell, nine, Coldwell 93. We need to go to. Um, sorry, one second here. Right, so yes, but I had that deforked and I have mounted it now onto a Celestron uh, CGEM DX equatorial mount, which gives me a lot more exposure now, um, even without a guide scope. Uh, but it's a 10 inch diameter barrel. Um, so the focal length is about 2,500 millimeters. And then obviously with the, the magnification from the different eyepieces. So yeah, I'm very proud, very, well, proud of it, very, very chuffed with it. Uh, a bit small enough to be portable. It fits in the back of my car and I can travel with it uh, when I go and do uh, outreach events. Uh, right, excuse me, I'm just gonna quickly uh, get everything set here. I need maybe 30 seconds and I'll be right back. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so while Ben is doing that, I'll, I'll just share a little bit about the, the difference between the alt azimuth mount that he mentioned versus the equatorial mount. So an alt azimuth, azimuth mount um, has two different directions of motion. Basically, it's a, it's a lazy Susan. It's a turntable that spins all the way around. And then it's got a lever um, that goes 90 degrees. And so it's a really uh, efficient mount to, uh, to build, uh, cost effective to buy. Uh, the only problem with an alt azimuth mount is that you get what's called field rotation. So as some of you probably know, the, the sky is always rotating above our heads because of the rotation of the earth. And so objects move in arcs across the sky. And so if you're tracking them with an alt azimuth mount, the orientation of the object actually rotates in the field of view um, as you're imaging it, which leads to um, skewed um, images. Um, and it makes it harder to digitally stack images over a longer period of time if you're doing that, because every picture you take, the object is in a slightly different orientation. An equatorial mount solves that problem because the telescope actually moves with the arc of the sky. And so you don't get field rotation at all. And so you're able to take much longer exposures without any rotation of the image in the field of view, either of the eyepiece or of the camera. Ben, looks like you're back and ready to go. Yes, I am back. The, the camera is taking the photo as we speak, hopefully. Um, yeah, so we're going to go for the, the Pavo cluster, which is NGC 6752 or Coldwell 93. So in the Northern Hemisphere, you have the Messier catalog. Uh, but obviously, Charles Messier wasn't able to see a lot of the objects in the southern skies. So uh, British astronomer Patrick Moore actually made a, uh, his own uh, catalog as well, but obviously couldn't use M because of Messier, so went with his alternative name. So the Caldwell catalog. Uh, and this one is also known as the starfish. Hmm. Very cool. Okay, so you can at least see that nice, uh, nice dense core of stars in the center. Um, nowhere near as large as Omega Centauri that we were looking at uh, the other week, which of course is potentially 10 uh, million stars, but as I think, as we said last time, it's uh, potentially a galactic core from a dwarf galaxy, so it's slightly different. This is a more traditional globular cluster, although as with all globulars, we're not quite sure where um, it originated from, whether it's one of ours, whether we stole it from another dwarf galaxy. But uh, it's sitting out there at around about 13,000 light years away uh, in the halo of our galaxy. So uh, not quite as far away as Omega Centauri, which was about 17,000. Um, and this, instead of over 10 million stars, this is say got about 100,000, which is a bit more typical of a, of a classic globular cluster, if you will. Um, yeah, it's, it's the fourth. We've got about 200,000 in the, the Hercules globular cluster, which looks to be a fairly similar brightness to this one in our sky. 
Yeah, I think so. If I, if I remember rightly, it's uh, Omega Sen and then 47 Tucana, which is right by the small Magellanic cloud that uh, we've also got down here, then M22 in Sagittarius, then this one, and then M13. So even though yours has got more stars, I'm not, uh, so I don't know M13 particularly well. We, we can see it here, but it's never very high up on the horizon. Um, but this one has also undergone some form of core collapse with the, uh, the larger stars migrating to the center and the smaller stars pushing out. And that's what gives it its uh, very, very bright appearance. Again, if you know where to look, you can just about pick it out with the naked eye under dark skies, uh, quite cool. close yeah. to the, the peacock star. Cool. Yeah, it's the same thing with the Hercules globular cluster, except that it's right at the zenith right now in the northern hemisphere. Wow. So it's a little tricky to find and trickier to track. Um, uh, but, yes, I'm sure. Yeah, but it's it's just visible to the naked eye if you know right where to look. You you kind of have to use your averted gaze to see it. You can't look directly at it, but if you get your peripheral vision activated, you can see just tiny, tiny little white smudge um, right where it is in the constellation Hercules. Yeah, if I remember right, it's sort of just in the box. If I if I remember right, yeah, that like sort of it, central part of it's like right armpit. <laughs> 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 not necessarily the place you want to be but yeah um, i've no idea in terms of size i mean this from one side to the other it, it's around about the same size as a full moon um if we were to capture all of it it would which equates to around about a hundred light years uh, across so I'm, I'm not sure if that if you would equate that to m13 as well i think that's about the same yeah uh, well, and, and again, I assume as with most globulars here, we've got a lot of binary stars, uh, especially down in the center here. Um, I forget which telescope it was that imaged it, but, but uh, one of them has uh, uh, apparently found that over 38, well, call it 40% of the stars within the core, there are actually binary star systems, um, which in itself, I think is quite a high amount. And because of that, we've got those uh, obligatory blue stragglers as well, those, uh, those younger generations of stars that you wouldn't necessarily expect to find in a stellar old age home like these uh, globular clusters. Um, and that is potentially from, say, all of those stars being so tightly packed in the center that occasionally they smash into one another uh, and that causes a sort of a new, or, or the, the, the debris that is produced there causes a new generation of stars to be born, which messes around a little bit with the, with the ages of some of these. Yeah, because usually you find really, really old stars in globular clusters, stars that are 10 to 12 billion years old. The, the first stars that formed from the primordial hydrogen and helium from the Big Bang. Yeah, and again, I think this one has been dated at somewhere around 12 billion years old, which, as we said, if we, it's the universe just under 14 billion years old. I mean, it's it's a wonderful window for astronomers to actually uh, look and, and see what those early stars in the in the universe must have looked like. So it's, it's, I always find it very humbling looking at globulars to, to see such sort of history in in, uh, uh, in a snapshot of time, as it were. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, it really is. And you know, with with um, um, with this one and um, uh, Omega Centauri and the Hercules globular cluster. Even just looking at them through a you know a fairly large aperture telescope like the ones that we have here, you know, twenty inch and plus telescopes, it's mesmerizing. It really looks like this image when you see it through one of those large aperture telescopes, and it's just beautiful to look at um, for no other reason than just to admire it. <laughs> yeah, so, as I said, they're they're, they're amazing amazing objects to see, and so we're so lucky to have. If you include really the M twenty two is south of the yeah. Well, in the southern celestial hemisphere, we, we've got four of the top five down here. So we, uh, or five of the top six, we can't really complain, that's for sure. <laughs> um, well, Ben, we're, uh, we're about out of time for this episode, um, but um, really appreciate you sharing these objects with us and um, connecting during the daytime. It's really easy for, uh, for me to do a virtual stargazing from my office and uh, appreciate you taking the time to uh, brave in the cold out there in, in South Africa to do this with us. No, it's, it's a great pleasure. It's uh, technology is wonderful these days, and it's a it's a, a treat to be able to show you guys some of the some of the stunning areas of sky that we've got here. Wonderful. Well, we'll uh, we'll see you again soon for another episode of the Cosmo Show. Great. Thanks. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Samuel. Yeah. Likewise.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Cosmo Show. I'm Dr. Sam, and uh, we're now joined by our local virtual stargazer, Dr. Mike Adler. Uh, hi, Mike. Thanks for being here. Well, glad to be here again. And uh, we're going to share with you a few images that uh, Mike didn't actually take himself, but he did the post-processing on. These are images from the Juno Cam. Uh, Mike, I'll let you tell us a little bit about them. Yeah, okay. So first, just a little bit about Juno. Juno is a satellite that NASA launched and has been in orbit uh, at Jupiter since 2016. And it has a very unusual orbit. It orbits over the poles. And, and it's the first uh, satellite that has ever gotten a view of the poles. In fact, so the first picture we're going to show you is a picture that is of the, the south polar region, which had never been seen before until Juno. And so it's uh, quite uh, quite remarkable. But its uh, goal was to uh, study the gravity, uh, magnetic field, and uh, composition of the planet. But sort of as an afterthought, I, I think it was an afterthought anyway, they put this small little camera on the side of it uh, to take actual color pictures of Jupiter. And NASA doesn't process those. They download, they make them available uh, to uh, amateurs. And so all the processing on the, these Juno cam uh, pictures are, are done by amateurs and like me. And so uh, uh, I'm going to show you, uh, I think, a couple of them that uh, I did. And they were not easy, by the way. But um, anyway, why don't we go on to the, um, uh, the first one and uh, we can, uh, I'll take it from there. So you're going to show the South Pole uh, image? I think we've got the, the South Pole image last, Mike. Well, the last. Okay. You, you're going to all right. Okay, so, so, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, so the first one we've got up now is the one that, okay, <laughs> we're moving again. Okay, so we, we've, the, the first one I think is the northern latitudes where you can see the great red spot. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay, so, um, yeah, this was a very challenging uh, a picture to do. Uh, it, it's actually the southern latitudes, by the way. So you're actually seeing a little bit of the South Pole uh, there. And, but you're seeing the various uh, bands and belts uh, of Jupiter plus the great red spot up, uh, up on the upper right-hand corner. So a little bit about all of that. Uh, taking that picture was quite challenging because the satellite orbit uh, is very irregular and it gets as close to, as 2,500 miles at the equator, but then it shoot, then while it going, goes over the poles, it's at 60,000 miles. And so these, this was a combination of four pictures taken along that orbit and they don't have zoom lens. And so each picture was taken from a different altitude, different field of view and, uh, and just, you know, with some spherical distortion in the lens and all of that good, nice stuff. So somehow to make a picture like that was, uh, was a big challenge and it, it took quite a while, it was not easy. But anyway, enough of that. So what are we actually looking at? Well, what you're seeing are the uh, various uh, 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 belts on uh, or, uh, on uh, Jupiter. You're looking again at the uh, southern part of the uh, satellite of the uh, planet. The uh, dark ones are called belts, and the light ones are called zones. And uh, the uh, they uh, they rotate in opposite directions. The uh, light ones go from west to east, and the zones not quite so fast going the other way. At the equator, the speed is uh, 450 miles an hour. So they they really get ripping. These are major storms. This is all a huge storm pattern. And uh, one of the uh, results of this, the Juno mission has been to determine that the actual depth of which these, the circulation, the surface is 3,000 kilometers. Uh, uh, or actually, I guess it's miles. 3,000 miles uh, depth is when these storms, the speed actually drops down to, uh, uh, well, it disappears. That's, that's the end of it. And then focusing on the uh, item that's such a uh, such a, uh, a prominent part of the planet and uh, its uh, lore is the great red spot. And so that's up in the upper right hand corner. And that's about 1.3 times the size of the Earth or, you know, maybe around 11,000 miles. It used to be uh, almost uh, twice that uh, in the 1800s. And it's disappearing. So the thinking is maybe in 20 or 30 years, it might not even be there anymore. But um, well, we'll find out. But it's, uh, it's uh, obviously a, a major feature of the planet. If you're an amateur, uh, you, uh, you have to try to photograph it and get a picture of the great red spot. The planet rotates once every 10 hours. And so you, uh, it's only certain times that you can actually see the great red spot. 
Um, it, it moves at around, it's an anti-cyclone, which means it goes counterclockwise and it moves at around 250 miles an hour and it takes about 14 Jupiter days to uh, complete uh, one orbit around the uh, spin of, of the uh, actual great red spot. So I think, uh, anyway, it's, uh, it was quite a challenge, but uh, I think the result, these are the most detailed pictures of Jupiter that have ever been taken because uh, even though the resolution of the camera is only about 2000 pixels, uh, it's a little closer than even, uh, 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 you know, than anything else. Uh, and and uh, so it, you're, you're getting a, a fairly high resolution, the highest resolution pictures of the planet that have ever been taken. Very cool stuff. Uh, let's take a look at that next image. Yeah, now, so, yeah, go ahead. No, go for it, Mike. Okay, yeah, this is now looking um, at, towards the uh, northern temperate uh, 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 region. We were looking at sort of the southern temperate in the previous, and we're not seeing the whole planet here, but you can see a little bit what, uh, what the north region looks like, and it's, uh, uh, again, with these very complex uh, belts and zones and, and storms that uh, make up uh, the planet, and it's... Uh, 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 there are some of these, I've, uh, I have done some work on taking that, even that image and zooming it in and seeing some incredible features uh, uh, in that, uh, uh, that you can see all sorts of pa strange patterns. It looks like uh, modern art. When you look at the, uh, uh, particularly when you zoom in, you don't see the edge of the planet at all. You just look at the patterns. It's, it's quite remarkable. These are, but these are all storms, uh, some cyclones, some anti-cyclones. Uh, that make up uh, the uh, incredibly turbulent atmosphere of the of the June of Jupiter. Mike, are these images in real color or false color? They are in real color, but they're accentuated. They're not false color. No, they're absolutely real color pictures. Yeah, they they have been uh, um, they have been juiced up a little bit, but they're the actual are they do represent actual two colors the fact that it's like blue at the poles is, is yeah weird. that's just water <laughs> there's there's water in the atmosphere that's a lot of it that's so yeah that's uh, you think that's, i would know this i have juno pictures as my laptop background <laughs> yeah yeah no yeah those that's the and, and all, a lot of the colors all come from uh, different elements there's uh, um the uh, uh the atmosphere is made up most of the planet is hydrogen but in the outer layers, uh, you have all sorts of different elements and it, the colors come from uh, just a uh, collage of uh, the mixing associated with these uh, various elements. Uh, and uh, speaking of colors, like, oh, oh, go ahead, Nick. I was just gonna ask about the shadow on the top right. Is that just part of what images were available or? That's right, it, it, that's it. That was just the pattern of the uh, actual satellite. Uh, and so we, to get a full, full image of the, of the planet, which is what I just we were just looking at, takes multiple pictures uh, from this. Uh, it it has a fairly narrow field of view. The, and remember what I was saying: it's only when it gets near the planet at the equator, it's only two thousand five hundred miles away. So it's taking a very small part of the. And then uh, the, the the next one we'll show will actually uh, be a, a when it's sixty thousand miles away, and it gives you a, a much larger chunk of the planet is visible at that point. Uh, but uh, making these pictures is uh, tricky. You have to somehow blend them together and uh, deal with the fact that they're not taken at the same altitude. And uh, so you have to scale and squeeze and what have you. Now this next one is my favorite. This is like right above the South Pole. Yeah, and there it is. So this image, had, this is a unique image because all the images up to now have, particularly from the Hubble or whatever, You've seen they, the Hubble is looking straight on at the equator. The, the planet has almost no tilt to it. Uh, the uh, Jupiter is uh, maybe three degrees of, of tilt uh, compared. So you're looking right at the ball uh, from uh, the distance of the, the Hubble. Um, but here's this uh, until Juno, we had never seen this before. And you, the pattern of storms is totally different. You, instead of having these uh, uh, belts and bands that are going around the, uh, uh, you know, the satellite, the, the planet, you have these cyclones and it's, they're in a kind of a, a pentagonal pattern. If you look closely, you'll see that there's a, there's a, there's five, five of them up there and, and they're all about 
5,000, 6,000 miles in size. And they're remarkably stable. I mean, the, the, this, and I should say that this particular picture uh, was a combination of, of three separate orbits. Now, the previous ones were all done in a single orbit, but at different, uh, were taken several images on the same orbit. This was done over three orbits because it, in a single orbit, you could not, it did not image the whole South Pole. So this is like the first, the third, and the fourth uh, orbit of the uh, of the satellite um, to combine, and it, basically each each orbit showed about a third of the. Uh, but there wasn't a lot of overlap, and so it was again difficult to piece it together. And uh, and there's a little blurring uh, at each edge because you know the, each orbit is takes 53 days, and so the the first orbit and the third orbit is uh, 150 days apart. And yes, these things aren't changing much, but they are changing a little bit. And, and so it is uh, making these images was, uh, was, was a challenge. But it's, it's spectacular, very interesting. Uh, and, and this is something that uh, uh, we had until Juno in 2016, uh, we'd never seen uh, what, the, what this looks like. So cool. Um, well, yeah. Mike, thanks for, thanks for, first of all, taking all the time to make those images and uh, secondly, for sharing them with us and uh, explaining it all to us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, well, I kind of, you know, I, I, I take pictures myself, of course, and but I, I, I do enjoy the, uh, the photoshopping and the post-processing, uh, but these, I must say, were, were extremely difficult to do. And mine, if you go online, you'll see other people's versions of this. I, I think mine compare reasonably well with what's, uh, what uh, you can find elsewhere as well. I have no doubt. Yeah. Uh, all right, folks, we're uh, running a little bit late, but we are going to be right back with our special guest, Valerie Steinmeck. Um, so stick around, and uh, we'll be back with the guest spot in just a moment. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Uh, we're here with Valerie Steinmeck, the founder of the Space Tourism Guide and contributing author, author of Forbes, uh, How Stuff Works, and Lonely Planet. Um, she's also the author of Dark Skies, a practical guide to astrotourism. Um, Valerie, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so uh, I, I like to start off all these conversations by asking the same question. And that is, um, what's the one question that you wish that everybody would ask you, but nobody does? That's a great question. I usually get that one if I get asked, it gets asked at the end and then I can bring in whatever I haven't had a chance to talk about yet. Um, the one I guess that I would say um, that I can start with and then we can move on from there is um, when we talk about astrotourism, it's a pretty broad term and it's something that um, maybe hasn't really been fully assimilated into the science half of the two worlds that I straddle. So if you think about, um, I cover both like space and travel and then astrotourism is this nice little Venn diagram overlap. And it includes everything from traveling for astronomy experiences, going to see the Aurora, eclipse chasing, um, anything like that. But the one that I think that often gets overlooked people don't think about is rocket tourism. So traveling to see rocket launches, which is increasingly an exciting prospect now that we have not only governmental organizations launching from, you know, a half dozen or so public locations around the globe to private launches happening, at least here in the U.S., we've got basically we've doubled the number of launch facilities in the last few months. And that's really exciting because um, that gets people very, it's very, very exciting, very physically stimulating to see a rocket launch. And it gets a lot of people more interested in rocket science and space science and what's going on. What are we launching? Why is it going? Um, and that often doesn't come up in my conversations about astronomy and astrotourism, but it's critically important. It's like this piece that we just sort of forget is 
what gets people interested, but also gets us all the technology up there that give us those great views, like the photos we were just looking at from Juno. I mean, I, I guess and now there's like a whole another category to add, right? Because like now we've like really got space tourism going on. Yeah, it's um, I would so I was at the Virgin Galactic launch. Um, I was there as a member of the media, so kind of critical, important thing because it was not open to the public. You had to either be invited as a guest or you had to be a member of the media. And that experience was, um, it was obviously it's you know it's, Sir Richard Branson is very good at putting on a show. He's very very good at marketing and branding. Um, so it was a bit of a show, but it was also this fascinating thing to realize that that eventually it will be quite common that there will be sort of everyday people like you know, the six of us that are on the screen right now, going to New Mexico and doing a few days of training and then suiting up and hopping onto a space rocket slash plane and uh, going to the edge of space. Uh, we can not get, <laughs> not get too nuanced on space versus not space and altitudes and all that. But, uh, you know, it is really fascinating to think that this is going to become common. I, I don't know what the timeline of commonality will be, but it's, it's going in that direction. We finally have normal ordinary citizens who've gone to space and that's the first time ever <laughs> yeah and I, i'm hoping to get a seat i don't know if you all saw this but richard branson is giving away two tickets on an upcoming launch you can actually buy uh two thousand entries for 150 dollars on omes i bought mine today so um yeah <laughs> we're entered but my whole household is entered <laughs> Yeah, so it's probably like way less likely like than winning the lottery. But hey, I'm like, I'm happy to throw down 150 bucks for 2000 chances to get to go to space, maybe. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah, there have been a bunch of people in my TikTok comments that are all of a sudden very educated about the Carmen line. And I'm like, I don't think you knew what that was a week ago. I don't really want to argue with you about it. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, and that's the other thing that that people, you know, we've seen a lot of discussion, obviously, especially since Jeff Bezos has launched just this past week. Um, a lot of commentary on, you know, is space tourism worthwhile? Is it is it a benefit to humankind? And this was one of the most recent stories I actually wrote. Um and one of the things that people often overlook is how much space tourism is going to put public attention on space access. And that is, in, in addition to all the other sort of societal and psychological benefits of space tourism, never mind the fact that we've got, you know, a lot more access for researchers to go up and do experiments. And um, it's just getting people interested and, and realizing that this there's so much technology we live with today that came from space. I mean, people don't Real, I've, I've always wanted to want to write the story of like how much technology we use in your home comes from NASA, but it's literally like almost all of it comes, almost all of it was either built for or tested in space before it was built, you know, on a mainstream accessible, you know, manufacturing line. And that is something people don't realize until they start paying attention to first billionaires and then millionaires, and then hopefully the rest of us eventually going to space. Yeah, so I mean, Valerie, I guess I would I would love to know like your personal take on the like the benefits of space tourism, and then I just love to hear like how, how you got into this line of work. Like, you know, I, I've got my story about how like I'm I'm super passionate about teaching people about the night sky, but um, how did you get passionate about writing about it? Yeah, I will start with answering um, of whether or not I think there is a benefit of space tourism. Um, my editor at How Stuff Works asked me to write that story last week to coincide with the Blue Origin launch. And it was funny because when I turned it in, one, it was way too long. It ran way, way over on the word count, of course. And then I said, you know, I'm really sorry, but it's clearly there's clearly a bias in my story. And it's that there are tons of benefits. Um, and it's not just for the one person who's getting that overview effect experience, which is wildly powerful and really not well understood from a psychology standpoint. And I'll come back to the psychology piece in a minute. Um, but as I said, you know, all the people who were there in person who saw the rocket launch were deeply uh, moved by the innovation and ability of the human species to overcome the greatest obstacle we know, which is gravity. Um, and then all the people at home who got engaged in this public discourse about whether space exploration, however you define it, is actually a worthwhile thing. And sure, there are, there are costs of going to space. I mean, the biggest one is environmental. Um, and then I see, I saw a lot of commentary and, you know, if you have this much money, why aren't you donating it to a worthy cause on earth? Um, and, you know, there's a lot of different ways we could have a discussion or I could have a take on that. But I honestly think, you know, it's, 
it's their own money to spend, first of all. We, we have not moved into a society where anyone else gets to tell them what they do with what they've earned, but there are, are working to create technologies that will have long-term benefits for humankind. And that is the greatest thing that being interested in the space sciences gives you is the long-term perspective. The ability to look millions or billions of years out into the Milky Way and beyond and realize that you know our little lifespan and our perspective is very small. And so we may not see the whole picture and we certainly don't see the whole picture when we're just deep in the bowels of Twitter, um, but, there's a lot more going on. These these are people who've designed companies that are going to change the future in dramatic ways. And that's a good thing, even if we can't see the full impact currently. Um, as for how I got into this field, I actually originally come from a background in psychology, which is why the overview effect is what really drew me to being interested in um, astronauts and space tourism and the accessibility to have that experience. Uh, and then I went into business and marketing for a while and ended up becoming a travel writer, which is this sort of meandering path, but it, it kind of makes sense if you look back. And so I was a travel writer until about 2016, 2017. And I realized I was very tired of writing stories that were like the 16 best cafes in Paris and the 12 places to find good Wi-Fi in Thailand. And I'm not to disparage travel writers who provide those resources. They are valuable resources for people, but I wanted to do something different. I wanted to have a, a creative take or cover somewhere that no one had ever been. And I realized there were two options. There was deep sea and deep space. And I, while I'm afraid of space, because I think you should have a healthy appreciation for anything that is that effective at eliminating life, uh, I'm more afraid of the deep sea. And so I kind of harnessed my childhood love of the night sky and started researching and you know, 2017, we thought, ah, oh, this will be the year for space tourism. And here we are four years later, we finally got there, but I just started writing about it. And I started writing about, you know, okay, space tourism isn't happening yet, but what else can you do to experience space on earth? And that's where my website, Space Tourism came from. Um, so on the website, you mostly find earth-based experiences, but I'd love to eventually write the, how to, you know, what is it like to go to space with Virgin Galactic or Virgin Galactic versus Blue Origin? I've tried them both, but I think that's probably a long shot. Um, yeah, so it's uh, it was sort of a meandering path that led me to be in this intersection of where travel and space science overlap. Very, very cool. You know, so Richard Branson, Jeff Bezos, if you're listening, watching this, you've got <laughs> someone here who would love to write a great comparative piece. So if you want to get <laughs> ahead of your competitor, Valerie Stein, because you're first, <laughs> beam her up. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> I'm also afraid of rockets, but that's a whole separate issue. I just respect them. They're very powerful and they have very intense forces on the human body. That's all. <laughs> Does that mean yeah. you prefer Virgin Galactic? Um, I, my personal, if you had me, if you said here are two tickets, which one would you choose? I would take Virgin Galactic in part because I think it looks a little bit more comfortable on like the G-forces experience, but also because it looked more spacious. I don't know if you watched both of the, the footage from inside the cabins and I don't know the square footage. They have not really released anything like that, but I, I found that the, the Blue Origin footage looked quite cramped, whereas in, in Virgin, and they were admittedly two passengers shy though, so was Blue Origin. Uh, it just looked like they had more space to move around the cabin and stretch out and float and do all the little, little like limb positioning and stuff. Um, so that's who I would go with at this point. I've also you know, seen what they have at their facility. Blue Origin doesn't yet have their um, public launch facility built or what that luxurious experience is going to be like. So it's a little hard to compare that way. Right. And I think they feel like there's something more elegant about a, a glider landing than a parachute landing too. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they said, you know, Wally Funk, she said it felt, she didn't even feel it. She didn't feel landing at all. It was that smooth and that delicate, which is great. That means they've proven some really effective technologies for um, land, effectively landing capsules without damaging components and including human components. But uh, yeah, I, I think the, gl the glide landing is really cool. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. They've got their, their pros and cons for each of them, but I think I'd go with Virgin if you had me go tomorrow. <laughs> For those of us who aren't looking forward to going to space anytime soon, what would your be like your number one recommended Earth-based destination for space tourism? Oh my gosh. Well, so as we started out, I kind of defined that there are these different forms of astrotourism. And so I would say it depends on what you want to experience. But other than 
uh, I won't say other than a rocket launch because it's different. If you want to have your mind blown open by astronomy on Earth, find yourself in the line of totality, the path of totality for a solar eclipse. Um, there is just something incredibly powerful about realizing that there's this giant celestial dance and occasionally the dancers line up just so, and I mean, I just remember in 2017 seeing the moon and realizing that's a, that's a sphere, like a huge sphere in front of a huge sphere. And they're lined up just perfectly for my sphere. And I was, it gives me goosebumps to talk about it because it's just this deeply moving experience. And you hear, if you've ever been in totality, where like people make these crazy noises because they're, they're like beyond the ability to express themselves in, in ver like verbally, they just like gasp and not moaning, but like sounds of awe. It's just so cool. It's cool from every perspective, but yeah, that's the one I would say is, you know, we've got um, here in the US, we've got uh, already people talking about the 2024 uh, solar eclipse, which uh, should be fantastic. Uh, passes over kind of a different path. It's got some overlap with the 2017 one, but should be a really, really good opportunity for people who didn't make it to totality to prioritize that and start prioritizing it now. Because if people are already talking about it, like me, <laughs> people are already booking, they're already trying to get reservations. And that means that things will be sold out and there will be traffic and all the things in 2017, but even more because now all these people saw it last time and want to see it again. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Valerie. The, we had totality here in Jackson um, for 2017. And it was mind blowing. I definitely made some of those sounds that you were talking about and then like started crying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was incredible. Uh, another really interesting tidbit. So there were hotel rooms like going for like $700, $800 a night leading up to the eclipse here in Jackson. The town ran this like anti come to Jackson campaign and scared a ton of people away. My dad drove into town the day before and got a hotel for a hundred bucks at Motel 6. <laughs> nice, that's very travel savvy, good for him. <laughs> it was just dumb luck. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say, I cut the 2017 one too and that, that convinced me, I already, already have my friend in Texas, I'm gonna hit up in 2024. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm. I, it was enough of experience for me. I'm like, all right, I would chase these around the globe. I would, mm -hmm. I would go places. I'm curious, how, how many have you seen now? Have you, uh, have you resorted to uh, eclipse chasing? I have been, in terms of solar eclipses, which I think is what most people would count as eclipse chasing, I, I'm definitely an umbrophile and that I love seeing them. Uh, and I would go see more. But if you look at the, historically, the map has been really hard difficult to see eclipses since 2017. I mean, it's been twice in Southern South America, and then I think at least one over Antarctica. And now we've got another one coming in December. In terms of the, the total solar eclipses, obviously we've had um, annular and partial eclipses visible elsewhere, but I've been very lucky to be living in places where eclipses have happened. So I saw both, no, I didn't see there was cloud, it was clouds, but I saw one lunar eclipse while living in the Bay Area. I tried to see another one. Um, the one, it was like January and, and July of the same year. And I, the July one got, or the January one got clouded out. Um, but then I moved to Cleveland, Ohio. So I, I feel those people who are saying that, you know, negative 30 or whatever, it's not that cold if it's not humid. Um, and I just got to experience the part, the sliver of partial eclipse here. It was just a few weeks after moving here in June. Um, and so I kind of by chance just happened to be moving where the eclipses also are visible. But no, I'm, I'm saving up. I want to do the 2023 annular eclipse over Crater Lake in Oregon. It will be, that's where annularity will be visible is Crater Lake. And then I plan to be in Indianapolis, Indiana for totality in 2024. I, I, got, a, I got a good question. For, I like making uh, random guesses at the future. When will these two branches of uh, space tourism collide? When will somebody pay to go up in a rocket to watch a solar eclipse? Well, I, if I remember correctly, NASA already was doing that. The NASA has a plan. They sent was, is it Sophia, I think. Sophia was up the plane. Oh yeah, um, was not up a rocket, there. Though, but yeah, yeah, not a rocket. I mean, I if if yeah, if you had the control over this, which admittedly it's kind of there's a lot of logistics. I would pay to be in the ISS. That I'd go there. <laughs> I have a question for you, if I sure. can chime in. So uh, to what extent do you think, or what, I guess for, speaking on behalf of yourself at least, do you, would you feel comfortable 
being a research subject, if you were to pay for a ticket on either a Blue Origin flight or Virgin Galactic, like, would you be comfortable with that? And if so, what kind of research projects? I'm just curious. Yeah. How do you feel Great question. <laughs> I like them, but I'd be willing to part with them if needed to test gloves. Um, <clears throat> I actually just tweeted at Sir Richard Branson about this because the FAA just sort of changed their definition of a of commercial astronauts that says that if you can't be one if you didn't do research. And I was like, just strap a heart rate monitor and GSR and pulse ox on everybody and send them up. And then you're getting a ton, a ton of data about human experiences of G-forces and microgravity that's like, we just can't get that stuff at scale when we rely on NASA and Roscosmos to launch, now China, to launch people to space. Um, so certainly I would be happy to provide my like uh, anonymized, I mean, here in the US, we're so obsessed with anonymized health data, but like I'd have, be happy to provide health data. Um, I think it'd be really fascinating to do like minor experiments that don't require technical training. So I wrote about the sort of like it was human tended experiment with uh, plants that they did on Virgin Galactic's flight. It was just a very simple protocol that she had to do. I'd be happy to do something like that if it um, benefits our understanding of both that branch of research and how humans can conduct research in space, especially non-professional astronauts. I think that it's worth asking people. I don't know why, I don't, I don't, some people just wanna go up and look at the view, sure. But I'd be happy to help out if it means that more people feel like space is benefiting them on earth and then they're more supportive of the industry. It's good to hear that because a lot of folks, so I, I'm actually on a team that is working to figure out how best to harness this whole setting to be able to do some great research moving forward and to get like as much data as possible, but while respecting that people are paying a lot of money for a ticket, you know? So it's a tricky thing, but thank you. Yeah, and I would say the other thing we, we often overlook in the space is the psychological impact. So I know of course NASA works with astronauts, they do pre-launch uh, assessments and you know post-landing assessments, but I we don't really have a ton of data on some of these things like the overview effect where we can just use really non-invasive methodology like surveys to gain more insight, um, getting that data is incredibly valuable. If we can, you know, if we could prove that a certain percentage of the population who sees Earth from space become rabid environmentalists and help protect the planet, let's get as many people up there as possible because those people are gonna come back and do that good work here on Earth, but we don't have the data yet. So even just simple surveys and, and that's very non-invasive for people who've paid a lot of money to go to space. Um, well, I, I could keep talking about this stuff for a long time. We're, um, <clears throat> we're already about 17, 18 minutes over. Uh, if, uh, if anybody has any uh, last questions for Valerie, please um, ask them and then we'll wrap things up. Valerie, any, uh, any last thing you want to leave us with? No, I just, I just wanted to thank you so much for having me. I always love coming on and talking about space tourism, especially when there has actually been space tourism to talk about. It's been many years of these conversations, like when do you think it will happen? Well, it's happened. Uh, now we get to move forward and see, you know, how do we make it accessible and reduce the environmental impact and get people excited about this? Yeah, well, I, I for one, am definitely excited about this. And I think a lot of other people are as well. Um, well, Valerie, um, thanks so much for being here. Um, thank you all the uh, co-stars for being here, our virtual stargazing, uh, stargazer, uh, Mike Adler, uh, Gavin, who's uh, behind the scenes doing the Zooming, and everybody else who makes the Cosmos show happen, uh, especially you out there who are watching. Uh, thanks for tuning in and joining us. Uh, and uh, we'll be back in a couple weeks. Um, so we hope to see you again then. Uh, until then, uh, be well and uh, keep looking up. We'll see you soon. Bye, everybody. <laughs>